So now what we'll do is um, give you an overview of basically where the Craft Accelerator is today and a little glimpse um, into the future. And I hope um, this brief presentation will give you um, an overview as we step into the four work streams and the panels that you're going to hear throughout the day, because the day will move relatively quickly as we go through um, all of the panel sessions. So we all know, and, and you just heard it from Nathan as well, that um, we all care a lot about precision medicine, and there's a good reason for that. It does work. And I think we've all seen the tremendous progress, whether it's genomics, whether it's what we're seeing immune, CAR T cells, but it's also the fact that data is everywhere, and data can be housed in the cloud, and now it can be analyzed. So there is so much progress going on in science and technology today. In addition, we also have a regulatory system, an FDA, um, that is run by amazing people that really believe in precision medicine and are trying to help all of us in oncology and other diseases, as shown by the fact that we had a record number of precision drugs approved. And by the way, a lot of those were in the field of oncology, which continues to lead the way in this space. But having said all that, we know that there still are challenges in precision medicine. And we know it's partly because the ecosystem is so vast. Even if I look in this room as we move from basic science to translation to the clinic to the payment, um, there's a reason why it gets so complicated. In the middle is the fact that um, the incentives don't align. If you really, and Clifton Leaf wrote a whole piece on this, but if you really look at how everybody's incentivized, it doesn't make any sense, which is why when Nathan says bring the leaders together to actually discuss it, that's how you find the sweet spot of where we can all play together. And as a result of that, we have silos. We know the silos can go across all cancers. The silos can go across technologies. The silos can go across data. It just happens, and it has to be solved by the right people. What we did up here at Harvard Business School that I think makes us so unique is this is a very good place to convene the best people. It's where everybody is willing to come. I don't think there's ever been a situation where Richard and I were holding a meeting that people didn't say, yeah, I definitely want to come up and, and meet the people that you're meeting with. But if you look at this chart, and we've spent two years meeting with the best of the best, it could be that we've met across all cancers. It could be that we get advised by other industries like the direct-to-consumer industry to help us out. It could be the data companies or the data analytic companies, pharma, industry. They all come up here to meet with us. And we have, trust me, met hundreds of the best of the best in the field of oncology and even other diseases over the last two years. What we've done that has been so important and why HBS is another great place to do this is access to the faculty. So one faculty member that we've worked really closely with is Mark Kramer, um, who works with Mike Porter, Michael Porter, and he focuses on collective impact. Collective impact is basically just saying, if we all as individuals work together in the field of oncology, for example, we will have a much greater impact than if we were all doing it individually. But in order for us to do that well, you actually have to create a culture in here that says we will be driven by a common agenda, we will look for things that we will work on together, and we will measure ourselves. And as you see these work streams and the panels that we do throughout the day, you will see that we literally sat with Mark and his team and said, how do we drive this forward in the field of oncology? And I promise you, it's working. As a matter of fact, if there's one takeaway, everybody ends up reading Mark Kramer's articles on this, and they take it all back to their company, because it's not just you know, an HBS thing. It works in many industries. And in addition to that, whenever we had our meetings up here, we always had access to the faculty that would remind us, you are business people. Any idea you have, you should build it to scale. You should always be looking for efficiencies in what you're doing and learn from other industries. It's a place that we come that we just keep getting good ideas as we work with the scientists and technologists that can really drive cancer forward. Now, when Richard and I first sat down with Mark Kramer and said, we want to cure cancer using collective impact. Can we do it? Um, the response was, well, it's a pretty bold and audacious goal. But yes, I would recommend breaking it down into different areas so that it's not quite so overwhelming. So it took about, um, I don't know, nine months, Richard, for us to really decide which four areas we would start working in. And it does make perfect sense if you think about it. The first is the patient, because 
the data is ours, the tissue is ours, and it's really important to us as a patient to know what our data looks like, but also our data in context with everybody else's data, because that's what drives toward new treatments. But once our data is out there, it has to get aggregated to a critical mass. Small data sets do nothing for us, and it has to be analyzed using the most efficient analytic tools. If you can actually use that data to drive toward new targets, then that must be taken to the clinical trial space in a much more efficient way, and you hear a lot about that today. If we can then create more shots on goal and an increased likelihood of those shots on goal, the funding will come in, hopefully in the most efficient way, to drive new therapeutics and new business models as well, so we can commercialize more drugs on behalf of all the patients we serve. So that was the method to Richard and my madness in the four work streams. Now let me just walk you through each of the work streams. On the direct-to-patient piece, which is run by Lori Marcus, she's the chair of that group, which is, she's right there, okay. Um, basically what we did was we did a fair amount of market research, not on one cancer, but across five cancers. And I know that sounds like that makes sense, it's never been done before. We've never had five cancers actually decide to do their market research together. But what we did find is it's definitely true. Patients are still very much overwhelmed in the field of oncology today. And when we actually asked them through market research, how much do you know about precision medicine, less than half knew what it was, had ever even heard of it. And when you asked them about genomic testing, 20% knew that there was a thing as genomic testing. They couldn't tell you anything, like whether it was fish or gene expression profiling or sequencing. And then only 30% knew their subtype. And in cancer, you really do need to know that if you get a cancer, it's not just pancreatic cancer or lung cancer. You have a certain subtype, and it really affects everything you do. So what we did as a team, again, across five cancers, talk about efficiency, is this team fielded the market research, and they identified where the knowledge gaps were. Where were patients getting into the most trouble where we could actually help to extend their lives? First and foremost, the most important thing you can do, and it's been shown in the literature to extend your life as a cancer patient, is get to the right center. Many times, it's an NCI-designated center. Most patients didn't know what that was. Secondly, it's a high-volume center, meaning that center sees more patients like you. If you don't do that, you're going to end up at a center that doesn't understand your disease. First step, that's what we had to start educating them on. Second step, we just want you to know genomic testing is out there. Even if you get fish and you start to know that, at least we're educating you on your subtype. Third is once you know your subtype, at least know there's a standard of care or a clinical trial for you. And as you do that, share every step of the way. Just four steps in there, and yet we know doing that most simplistic thing can absolutely extend the patient's life. So we also decided, as five cancers working with one agency, to work with Facebook and many of the um, direct-to-consumer companies that Lori had brought onto the Harvard campus with us to start to build out our own social campaign, driving patients to the trusted third parties um, that would allow them to understand how to get to the right center, to the right treatment, and, and walk them all the way through that. And all of this work is being um, piloted, coming out in May, and all market research will be done to actually test, did we change awareness, did we change behavior of our patients, are they more knowledgeable and doing the right thing? And then we'll extend that out to the entire cancer community, um, and as you know, we do a lot of our work, publications, and making sure everybody knows what we do real time. So that was the first part of getting patients much more knowledgeable about precision medicine and understanding the importance of their data. But we all know that data needs to be shared. And as you look at this chart, you see it's basically an archipelago. We did this chart two years ago here at Craft. We said we will document through Gabriel Eichler, who's in the room and he runs this data and analytics group, we will document the major oncology data sets out there. So while this looks quite simplistic, behind every one of these circles, Gabriel is tracking for the cancer community. Anybody will have this chart when this, all this material when it goes out. Is this data on the x-axis, is it genomic? Is it clinical? Is it longitudinal? 
Is it structured? Because that's what we want. We want high quality data sets. If you look on the Y axis, it's is in the public domain because you actually want as much data out there as you possibly can get. So what we're finding is the data sets are getting larger, 25% increase in the data, but we still desperately need to build the bridges across these data sets to make sure we aggregate it in the most thoughtful way. When we started looking at this, we realized the best way and the best business model for actually getting the data sets to aggregate is to understand the question that you're asking. So an example would be, you have cancer, you need to validate a specific target. You may have a great data set at a disease foundation. I'll use the Compass data set at the MMRF. It's a great data set, but it may not give you quite enough data to say, this is a target so important the pharmaceutical and biotech companies are gonna go after it. I then need a data set from UPenn or Dana-Farber or others. How do we force the aggregation of those data sets to create validation of targets and or how we use the current drugs of today? What we are finding, and this is where Gabriel again is coming in, and we'll be launching this as well, a full landscape of the AI companies and machine learning companies out there so that when you get stuck, we'll tell you where the data is out of the HBS work. We will tell you which company is in your space on the machine learning side. You frame the question. We will be doing workshops and programs up here to tell you how to do this really, really well. Um, and you'll hear a, a beautiful case study on this today during one of the panels. Now, if you actually can validate the target and you know it's really important, the way the system has been running forever is pharma, and, and I'm not being negative because I, I came from pharma, it, pharma runs trials and tons and tons of drugs, right? We throw them all out there. But it's not necessarily the most efficient way to do it because what you see from the statistics is when we look at clinical trials here, Basically, 20% fail, 80% are delayed, and we believe me, we all know these statistics. It's dismal. And then you look at the immunotherapy space, right? So as a patient myself, there's no space I'm more excited about than immunotherapy. I mean, I just think it offers so much progress, uh, promise along with the targeted therapies. There are hundreds of these drugs hundreds, there are thousands of these trials. We do not have nearly enough patients to actually do the immunotherapy trials. There is no method to the madness out there right now. And if patients knew it, I think they would be alarmed and so unbelievably frustrated. So we have to find better ways to do clinical trials. And we were working with FDA, it was actually Rick Pazder um, who approached us and said, there's got to be a better, more efficient way around these trials. Would you take a look at what's happening, what they call platform trials? Think of it this way, the way trials are typically run now, you have one control and then one drug, and you just keep throwing them out there, throwing them out there. In platform trials, think of it differently. You've got one control, multiple arms. The patients may move through different arms based off of what's the right thing for them using statistical design. So it does make sense. They're just complicated and hard to get off the ground. So what we did up here um, to work with FDA and Kraft was we said, well, there's a number of studies that already started in breast cancer, lung cancer, AML. But ironically, there's four studies, major, major studies, trying to get off the ground right now in four different cancers. So one is glioblastoma, myeloma, pancreatic, and then immunotherapy. So what we have done up here is we've had all four of those studies meet. They work together every week. They share their metrics. In real time, we're identifying their challenges. Why can't that study start on time? And then together, we're just pro providing the solutions of how do you fix this and publish it so that the next round of platform trials doesn't have the problems of the current ones of today. And then we can report that back out to FDA so that new trials can start in. So it's been a much more efficient way for all of us to work together. And again, I know it sounds like it's obvious. You have never, ever had any cancer sit down and on the phone share their timeline and you know the fact that they're late with every other cancer out there, just real-time metrics. It doesn't happen unless you actually have a third-party space like this where we are all working together and publishing that data. Now, once you actually get the trials done, I personally think that when you actually build major trials like that and you're getting close 
um, it's also a great time for venture and new ideas to come in because it's a good I thought that that drug may make it to market and you're getting closer and closer and the trials are expensive and they're much better funded by trusted third parties that hold the IND. So look at the disease foundations though. Um, you know, there's 1362 cancer disease foundations out there, but 90% don't raise more than $5 million. Now, it's really hard to be doing the programs and the fundraising when you run these organizations. And for some reason, they just can't get it off the ground fast enough. AMC's definitely much better on the fundraising side, um, but they're doing a little bit more on the basic science. And then, as we know, there's still the challenge of how much money has to be invested and how long it takes to get a drug to market. So Richard and I have been really studying the venture space and trying to figure out how do we do this so much better. So there have been an abundance of calls we've done on every model out there to truly get this. We all know um, the cystic fibrosis model. Um, we're very familiar with it. Te Richard teaches that class. Um, but now we also followed up with that with the JDRF model. So Sean is here today to talk about that one, which we think is a really um, slight difference, but a really interesting model that he's doing in diabetes. And, and I love um, talking with Sean because, you know, their focus in diabetes is all the immune drugs have a side effect of causing diabetes, and we're all trying to build immune models too. So it shows you why different diseases have to talk with each other, because if you were building funds, you might care about both of those things in the immune space. But again, those conversations wouldn't happen if we didn't have the craft initiative going on here. And then there are a number that are actually doing for-profit companies like Duchenne's Muscular Dystrophy, um, where it's just a company completely dedicated to dr drugs in that field and also to structural um, things that will help the patients with that disease too. And then um, finally, you'll hear us, um, Andrew Lowe is one of our keynotes today, who will talk about the mega fund of how you actually analyze where your disease is, how much money you need for it, and how do you build that out into a fund um, that would drive success forward too. So at the end of this, um, you know, we all walk in and, and we understand the challenges are still in the ecosystem. And we all understand that it has been a, a crazy backward system where drugs go out and we hope it works and we move forward. I hope that as we move forward at the Craft Initiative, that our focus really becomes on where is the unmet need? Where is the unmet need for the patients we serve? and the questions come from the patients we serve. So it may be that there's a certain unmet need in breast cancer, or there's a certain unmet need in glioblastoma. They look very different, to be honest with you. They may all benefit from immunotherapy, so that could be a universal unmet need. But as you look at these diseases, you also have to say they're very different. So some may have a multitude of treatments, some may have no treatments at all. So how do you build a plan for these cancers when they all look so different? Do you go across a platform and just fund immunotherapy or do you fund the cancer itself? And then you also have to look and say, where is the money coming in? Is it going to come in because you actually have philanthropists in your cancer or is it going to come in because um, you've got to develop another new model from a foundation? It all takes tremendous leadership and it takes really strong trusted third parties. And what ends up happening is you have to find someone similar to the crafts who say, I'm super passionate about this idea. I want cancers talking to each other. I'm going to fund a new idea and bring it together. You have to have the people that care about this looking for trusted, part trusted third party leaders to pull it together. My hunch is many of the people that want to lead in this space are sitting in this room today. And we've seen it firsthand as Richard and I have worked with all of you in specific work streams, our hunch is we bring it all together now across all four work streams, and it's where these models really start to come to fruition. And I say that, and I, I promise you all that the reason I think it's so important to do it here is because of how we started this conversation. There is no one more committed to trying to bring leaders on this campus to develop new models and make a difference. And there are two men that I work with continuously with Robert and Jonathan, who their intense focus is build the right teams and drive toward results. And every time Richard and I meet with Robert and Jonathan, the question is, that's great. What is it going to do for the cancer patient? What's it going to do for the family? 
how fast are you going to get it done? And that's just music to Richard in my ears as well.